In this lecture we focus on the thyroid as a whole. Although in the everyday practice we focus on the nodular goiter, we try to demonstrate that the description and analysis of the thyroid is not superfluous. The differentiation of discrete echo abnormalities, first of all hypocogenic areas, lesions and nodules is the essential of thyroid ultrasound. We give some viewpoints to the differential diagnostics of these lesions. Finally, we briefly discuss the significance of the hypocogenic thyroid, that is the impact of ultrasound in the diagnostic of autoimmune thyroid disorders. There are two important features of the thyroid itself, first the size of the organ and second the basic echo structure. In the event of a nodular goiter, the discrete lesion is in the forefront and the analysis of the basic echo structure is not infrequently forgotten. In this manner we may miss to diagnose an underlying autoimmune thyroiditis. Although a qualitative description of the thyroid size shares no negative consequences in most cases, that is in normal or decreased thyroids, it is advisable to give the three diameters even in this situation. Not only because of propriety but it has relevance in quality control, may decrease the failure rate and it may have relevance for the future if later in the course the thyroid becomes diseased. There are several clinical situations where the determination of the thyroid volume is essential. If the thyroid is composed of multiple nodules it is very hard or even impossible to measure the diameters of single nodules. To measure the three diameters of a single nodule is not only not reproducible but has significantly less impact on the fate of the patient. Our decision to indicate surgery or to suggest follow-up is determined by the degree of thyroid enlargement caused by the numerous lesions. Moreover, in the latter case when the patient is regularly checked later I the course, the judgment of the progression is based on the size of the whole thyroid determined at first examination. Let's see an example. This thyroid is composed of multiple nodules. It is very hard to decide where are the borders of one or another nodule. This four images represent four different sections of this highly enlarged thyroid, but if we move the transducer and alters the angle new lesions will appear. In such thyroids it is hard to imagine to give correct and reproducible measures of single nodules. On the other hand we can give the diameters of the whole lobe which may serve either of the decision about surgery or the basis of a subsequent follow-up investigation. The thyroid increases with age and body mass. The diagnosis of a diffuse goiter can be made exclusively on volume determination of children. The horizontal view and the longitudinal views of the thyroid are presented in two children. Although the younger children has a larger thyroid, it is impossible to decide whether the thyroids are normal or increased. The 50 and 95 percentiles are given in this figure. The age volume curve has relevance in epidemiological studies but has only limited relevance in the differential diagnosis of a given patient. Let's compare the previously demonstrated cases to the age volume curve. The girl with the larger thyroid marked with red seems to harbor a diffuse goiter because the volume is above the 95 percentile. However, if we compare the size of the thyroid to the body surface, the situation changes. The larger thyroid proved to be normal while the smaller mark with blue did abnormally increased. The diagnosis of diffuse goiter should be based on body surface volume curve and not on the age volume curve in children. As regards the calculation we refer to the publication of the WHO. Although it requires additional time, we have to calculate the body surface area in each child in order to determine the presence or absence of thyroid enlargement. The determination of the volume of the whole thyroid has relevance even in solitary nodules. We have to be aware that the indication of surgery is in fact not the size of a single nodule but the size of the lobe containing nodule or nodules. Both patients presented one dominant nodule. The size of the nodule was significantly larger in the left patient, however as regards the size of the thyroid, the situation was the opposite. The left patient did not require surgery while the indication of surgery is clear in right patient. Brun has described the thyroid as a spheroid. 
the calculation of this conformation is given. The difference between the exact measure and that described in the formula with bold letters is less than 5%, far beyond the intra-observer variation of volume determination which is at least 25%. While the horizontal diameter of a thyroid lobe rarely exceeds even the length of the smallest probe used for the thyroid, the longitudinal diameter frequently exceeds that of the length of the largest probe. In order to measure the longest diameter of a nodule or a lobe exceeding the field of vision we have to find an anatomical intrathyroidal structure. In the left patient it might be the small hypocogenic lesion mark with white arrow or the solid part of the large cystic nodule marked with yellow. We have moved the transducer slowly downward until the lowest part of the thyroid comes into sight. By combining the two diameters we get the longest diameter of the lobe. In the right patient we chose the relatively large hypocogenic area in the ventral pad of the thyroid and we measured the diameter between the upper pole of the thyroid and the hypocogenic lesion. Thereafter we measured the distance between the hypocogenic lesion and the lowest part of the lobe and summed the two distances. The echo structure of a thyroid lobe may be normal or hypocogenic. We prefer to differentiate according to the degree of hypocogenicity. The thyroid frequently presents a basically echonormal structure with various amount of hypocogenic areas in the event of autoimmune diseases and de Corvain's thyroiditis. The echogenicity index reflects the estimated amount of hypocogenic areas. The connective tissue mark with red ventral to the thyroid is a hyperechogenic tissue while the muscle pointed with yellow arrows between the connective tissue and the thyroid is a deeply hypocogenic structure. Four thyroids with different echogenicities are presented. The echo pattern is influenced by various factors including the vascular supply, the strength with which we press the transducer to the skin, the thickness of the anatomic structures in front of the thyroid. Nevertheless, the two extremities share an unequivocal meaning. The echonormal thyroid means that the patient has less than 1% chance harboring an autoimmune thyroid disease while the deeply hypocogenic pattern means a diseased thyroid, first of autoimmune problem in all probability. An echonormal minimally hypocogenic thyroid is presented in the left while a moderately hypocogenic one in the right images. The echogenicity decreases with age. Such a hypocogenic thyroid presented left in a young patient would be almost diagnostic for an autoimmune thyroiditis while more than 50% of healthy thyroids in men over 70 years are minimally or moderately hypocogenic. The basic structure of these thyroids are normal or only minimally hypocogenic however the thyroids present small hypocogenic areas. These are characteristic presentations of an autoimmune thyroiditis. The echogenicity index has relevance in echonormal thyroids presenting discrete hypocogenic areas. Four examples are given in the table. The echogenicity index closely correlates with the activity of the underlying autoimmune process. The change is the degree of hypocogenicity may serve as a diagnostic tool in the event of Graves' disease and has a similar significance as its AB test. The echogenicity index correlates with the clinical presentation of de Corvain's thyroiditis. At first visit the complaints were localized to the right lobe while the left thyroid was only tender. As in most cases of granulomatous thyroiditis, later in the course the initially not or less affected lobe became painful while the complaints have been resolved in the firstly affected lobe. Corresponding to this course the hypocogenic areas have decreased in the right while increased in the left thyroid. Hypocogenicity is the ultrasound presentation of Hashimoto's thyroiditis and Graves' disease. The former presents in more than 90% of cases discrete hypocogenic areas. The differential diagnostic of hypocogenic discrete lesions is one of the greatest task in thyroid ultrasound. A distinct lecture focuses on this problem. We present here several examples. First a relatively simple task. The thyroid is echonormal with many hypocogenic areas of various sizes. The echogenicity index was around 30%. We found no suspicious lesions. The hypocogenic area in question was located in the ventral lateral part of the left thyroid. 
none of the hypocogenic areas fit nodule. These were in fact more active foci of lymphocytic thyroiditis. First the left case. There is a hypocogenic lesion in the central part of the lobe. The thyroid contains much smaller hypocogenic areas which decreases but by no way excludes the possibility of being the large lesion in nodule in a pathological sense. The lesion presented in the right images contained small hypercogenic punctate granules resembling microcalcifications. The presence of other, similarly hypocogenic areas in the dorsal part of the thyroid decreases the chance that the larger lesion would be a nodule in a pathological sense, but this possibility cannot be excluded. Both patients underwent surgery. Histopathology disclosed in both cases Hashimoto's thyroiditis without any nodules. The right thyroid presented the so-called micronodular form of Hashimoto's thyroiditis, while there were two larger hypocogenic, nodule-like lesions in the lower dorsal part. We cannot decide solely on ultrasound pattern whether the hypocogenic lesions are nodules in a pathological sense or are not. Cytology resulted in Hashimoto's thyroiditis. The origin of the lesions in the right lobe may be questionable. These may presentations of a multinodular goiter. Nevertheless, the borders are not regular geometrical, there are intralesional fibrotic changes. These properties argue against being these lesions nodules in a pathological sense. If have any doubt then the analysis of the left thyroid decides the issue. Great part of this lobe is hypocogenic. The small echonormal discrete areas correspond to intact parts of the lobe. First the left case. The thyroid contains a hypocogenic lesion presenting a complete halo. Although there are smaller hypocogenic areas in the lobe, these are less hypocogenic. The large lesion is a nodule in a pathological sense in all probability. The patient underwent surgery. Histopathology disclosed Hashimoto's thyroiditis and a herbal cell adenoma in the right lobe. The presentation of the left case is strikingly similar to that of the left one. On the other hand, the deeply hypocogenic, halo-like structure can be found only on small parts of the lesion. The borders between the discrete lesion and the non-lesional part of the thyroid is blurred and there is minimal if any difference between the echogenicity of these parts of the lobe. Although these properties stands against the possibility of a nodule in a pathological sense, we cannot decide whether this lesion is a nodule or not. Histopathology disclosed no nodule. We can detect even in most healthy thyroids hypocogenic areas. It is essential to discriminate lesions with clinical or oncological significance from those which harbors harm to the patient neither at the time of discovery nor later in the course. To differentiate a hypocogenic area of Hashimoto's thyroiditis from a nodule in a pathological sense is one of the greatest challenge in thyroid ultrasound. We have to make every effort to distinguish these possibilities but not infrequently we cannot fulfill this expectation. It is to be avoided giving an unfounded ultrasound diagnosis in such cases. On our opinion, the use of term nodule for a discrete hypocogenic lesion is not accepted and causes a huge harm, both to the patient by causing unnecessary fear from carcinoma and to the evaluation system by initiating unnecessary investigations. Regrettably, even the current algorithm of thyroid diseases uses the term nodule for a discrete hypocogenic area. The most frequent mistake made on ultrasound examination is the overuse of the term nodule. The term nodule has to be restricted for those lesions which are nodules in a pathological sense, that is hyperplastic or colloid nodules or adenomas or carcinomas. A distinct presentation focuses on this issue. We only mention some viewpoints which may be of help in differential diagnostic of hypocogenic lesions. Not more than three small hypocogenic lesions are frequently found in healthy thyroids. The borders of these lesions are relatively sharp and they do not exceed 10 mm in maximal diameter. A thyroid in Hashimoto's thyroiditis presents significantly more discrete areas, the echogenicity of which are different, from minimally to deeply hypocogenic. The size of these areas ranges from 1 mm to several centimeters. In contrast with the former, a nodule in a pathological sense has a regular geometrical shape, 
benign nodules present a sharp border. In contrast with nodules in a pathological sense, the pattern of autoimmune thyroiditis may change over time. A diffuse hypokagenic pattern turned to be echonormal presenting small hypokagenic areas. The analysis of the longitudinal scan is more important than the horizontal view in the differential diagnostic. Larger lesions of Hashimoto's thyroiditis frequently mimic hypokagenic nodules on horizontal scan, while longitudinal scan demonstrates the irregularity of this areas. Let compare the regular geometrical form and regular borders of the cystic nodule in the left with the irregular shape and puzzle-like borders of the hypokagenic area of thyroiditis. These cases demonstrate that an unequivocal differentiation is not always possible on ultrasound. The involvement of clinical data, palpation, results of laboratory investigation may be of help. In doubtful cases aspiration cytology is mandatory. Focusing exclusively on discrete nodules and overlooking the basic pattern of the thyroid during an ultrasound examination divests the patient and the clinician of very important information. The basic pattern of the thyroid has huge impact in the evaluation of a thyroid patient. We only briefly discuss here this topic presenting a few examples. We meet in every consulting hours patients who present only one sign of thyroid diseases. The patient presents neither a nodule on ultrasound nor any biochemical abnormalities but does a hypokagenic pattern. If we overlook this hypokagenicity we state that the thyroid is healthy and hinder the detection of a hypothyroidism in time developing later in the course. Let's compare the fate of these two young women. Although the possibility of Hashimoto's thyroiditis was raised on first ultrasound reports, the anti-TPO levels were normal. The therapist of the left patient suggested TSH determination in every two years and in the event of pregnancy at once. The patient made a TSH test at the very early pregnancy and a hypothyroidism was detected. She delivered a healthy child. The right patient had a worse outcome. She was told to have a healthy thyroid because anti-TPO was normal. Therefore she did not check her thyroid function. She aborted twice in the next 14 months, in the 8th and 10th weeks of pregnancy. We met her two days before the second stillbirth's one TSH test was performed and resulted in 9 MIU slash L naturally. It is not sure that the hypothyroidism was liable for the two abortions but this is a very likely explanation. The degree of hypocontinicity and the vascularization may serve as a prognostic factor under two circumstances. In the event of a postpartum thyroiditis, the likelihood of permanent hypothyroidism is significantly greater if the thyroid is hypocogenic compared with echonormal pattern on ultrasound. The histories of these patients demonstrated the prognostic value of vascularization in postpartum hyperthyroid states. The thyroid was deeply hypocogenic and presented increased vascularization in the left patient who had developed a permanent hypothyroidism. On the other hand, the thyroid of the right patient was echonormal with an echogenicity index of 15% and a normal vascularization. Her thyroid function returned to normal level later in the course. The other example is Graves' disease. More hypocogenic the thyroid and more the vascularization at the time of discontinuation of thyrostatic therapy, greater the risk of a subsequent recurrence as is illustrated in these two examples. These ultrasound properties have similar relevance as a TSAB test. The vascularization of the thyroid may be of help in the differential diagnostic of hyperthyroid states, that is in postpartum hyperthyroidism and in the differentiation of Graves' diseases from the so-called hashitoxicosis. A normal or increased vascularization can be observed in both opportunities. However a decreased vascularization is a very strong argument against the possibility of overproduction and favors the destruction as the cause for elevated thyroid hormone levels. The left patient with less than the average vascularization became spontaneously hypothyroid months after the initial examination performed in hyperthyroid state. On the other hand, the right patient presented an increased vascularization. Despite treated with thyrostatics, the hyperthyroidism recurred later in the course.